Amen. Well, like, like I mentioned, we're in the fifth week of our series, Solomon, and we're going to talk about giving God the best. And over the last few weeks, we've talked about a lot of different things. We talked about some of the things that confronted Solomon through his life, how his throne was, was um, there was two different uh, times where his throne could have been taken before he became king. Of course, he became king. Then he asked for wisdom. He gained wisdom and built a very prosperous and wealthy nation there in Israel. Um, and today, we're going to look at what he did even more so with that wisdom and with the wealth and the prosperity that he had. You know, just because you're wealthy, just because you have a lot, doesn't mean that it then becomes easy to give. Um, as a matter of fact, it can become even harder to give. And so Solomon was going to be confronted with this with this temptation of whether he was really going to give to God or not, or whether he was going to keep it for himself. You know, um, there was a man one time who, who was a little skeptical of Christianity, and he went up to a preacher and he says, all I hear from Christianity is give, give, give. That's all I hear. And the preacher very thoughtfully responded back to him. He says, yes, but isn't that what Christianity is all about? And, and really it is. Christianity is about giving. It's about, and, and, and oftentimes we think of it just in a financial sense, but it's the giving of our time, like we just talked about, the giving of our hearts, our compassion, our love for the people around us in our community. It's, that is what Christianity comes down to, is giving. But it's hard, because the whole idea of discipleship, discipleship, if, if, if that may be a kind of a fancy word uh, for some of us here today, really discipleship is the process that God uses in order to grow people. Uh, there's another word, sanctification is another word. But it's what God does. He grows us through this process of discipleship. And the, and the whole idea of discipleship is to get us further and further away from our selfish nature and to more and more align with the nature of God through Jesus Christ. And, and really, when we talk about give, give is perhaps the best way, one of the best ways to do that. The more you give, the more it is you're moving away from that selfish nature and you're moving more and more toward God's nature. And, and just think about God's nature itself. I mean, he gave us his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross. Can someone give more than that? And then on top of that, he's given us all of the blessings that we have in our lives. All of the things that we have. All of the, the God has just so overwhelmingly blessed us. He's been so good to us. And so we look at his example when it comes down to uh, moving away from our selfish selves to a self to, to someone who is about others, who loves others, and who gives to others. I've shared this uh, story before, but I, and I think I've shared it multiple times. It's a little, it's really short, but, but I think it's so true. Uh, it's so funny, too. On, the, on their 50th wedding anniversary, there was a couple who was asked to sum up their marriage relationship. You know, how, what's the secret here? How did you stay married for that long? And the husband replied, he said, I've never, I've tried never to be selfish. After all, there is no I in marriage, he said. Well, and then his wife said, well, for my part, I've never tried to correct my husband's spelling because um, there, there is an I in marriage. Um, but, but we get the point. The, the whole idea of discipleship is to move us away from the I and to move, to move us to the we, to the us, and ultimately to God. And so, um, you know, the, the thing is, is we, we, we too often, I'm going to pull up this first point as we we get into this. We too often make a decision that is based on what we want or what I want rather than how we can give God our best. We, we often, when something happens in life, we don't stop first and think, okay, what does God want me to do in this? The temptation so often is, okay, what is best for me? I, I mean, I've been confronted with that a lot of times in my own life. I mean, I would be, I would not be honest with you if I didn't tell you. There's times where I'm like, okay, God, would it be better for me to serve somewhere else? And then God's like, no, this is where I want you. This is because sometimes those selfish things come in, right? You think, oh, we, we know the, we, we've all heard the saying, right? The grass is greener on the other side, right? I mean, we, we, it's so often about us. And we have to consider what it is that God wants from us. I don't know, maybe for you, uh, maybe a new job opportunity comes along. And it becomes a situation where, where it's something that, that is better for me. Maybe it's better financially. Maybe it's better in other ways. But have you stopped to consider, is that what God wants you to do? I, 
I, I'm afraid so often we don't. I mean, it comes into other things too, the way that we spend our money. Do we stop and think, what is it the best way for God to use this? Or is it about myself? You know, really, Solomon, as he is growing in wisdom and stature, you might think, oh, well, things just got easier for him. No, really, with more wisdom and more stature and more prosperity came more temptations. Where he, he could start thinking about his wisdom. Well, look at me, I'm such a smart guy. Or, or with his wealth, he could think, wow, I've, I've got all this money. It's all because of me. I mean, he, he really had become in the ancient world a celebrity. People were coming and wanting to hear from him about his wisdom and look at his wealth and the prosperity that he had brought to his country. I mean, he could have so easily become about himself. That temptation was definitely there. And we're going to be today in 1 Kings. We're going to actually look at three chapters. And let me tell you, this is a little bit of a challenge today for me because we're going to be looking at a lot of text, but I'm going to kind of be mixing it up a little bit, okay, so that you don't have to just hear me read, read, read the whole time. Okay, but, but in 1 Kings 5 through 7, we're going to see how Solomon responded to this question of how he was going to give his best. And really, I hope for you that you're thinking, okay, how can I give my best um, to God? Okay, so let's go ahead. We're going to jump into it here. Verse 1 in, in 1 Kings uh, chapter 5. It says, When Hiram, king of Tyre, heard that Solomon had been anointed king to succeed his father David, he sent envoys to Solomon because he had always been on friendly terms with David. All right, and so Solomon sent back this message to Hiram. He said this, You know that because of the wars waged against my father David from all sides, he could not build a temple for the name of the Lord his God until the Lord put his enemies under his feet. If you go back, and I'm not going to go into this a whole lot, but, but God had instructed uh, David that he couldn't build because of, really, in essence, the blood that was on his hands. I mean, all the people that had died and all the wars and all these different things that had happened. And then there were some other things in, in David's personal life, too, that, that God said, no, it's, this is going to wait for Solomon, all right? So that's what, what Solomon's referring to here in verse 4. He says, but now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side, and there is no adversary or disaster. And I intend, therefore, to build a temple for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord told my father David when he said, your son, whom I will put on the throne in your place, will build the temple for my name, all right? So give orders that cedars of Lebanon be cut for me. My men will work with yours, and I will pay you for your men whatever your wages you set. You know that we have no one so skilled in felling timber, timber as the Sidonians. Now, when Hiram heard Solomon's message, he was greatly pleased and said, Praise be to the Lord today, for he has given David a wise son to rule over his kingdom, or his great nation. And so Hiram sent word to Solomon, I have received the message you sent me, and will do all you want in providing the cedar and juniper logs. And my men will haul them down from Lebanon to the Mediterranean Sea, and I will float them as rafts by sea to the place you specify. There I will separate them, and you can take them away, and you are to grant my wish by providing food for my royal household. Okay? And in this way, Hiram kept Solomon supplied with all the cedar and juniper logs that he wanted. And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as, as food for his household, in addition to 20,000 baths of pressed olive oil. Solomon continued to do this, for Hiram, Hiram year after year. And the Lord gave Solomon wisdom, just as he had promised him. And there were peaceful relations between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty. So things are going good, right? King Solomon conscripted laborers from all of Israel, 30,000 men. It's a lot of men, right? And he sent them off to Lebanon in shifts of 10,000 a month, so that they spent one month in, in Lebanon and two months at home. I thought that was a really cool thing. I mean, he was thinking of his workers. You know, he didn't want him to be, a long, be gone for a long time. I mean, it says something, I think, about Solomon's heart. It tells us something, right? And then it says here, Adoniram was in charge of the forced labor. And then in verse 15, Solomon had 70,000 carriers and 80,000 stonecutters in the hills, as well as 3,300 foremen who supervised the project and directed the workers. Man, this is a project, isn't it? And at the king's command, they removed from the quarry large blocks of high-grade stone to provide a foundation of dressed stone for the temple. And the craftsmen of Solomon and Hiram and workers from Biblos cut and prepared the, the timber and stone for the building of the temple, all right? So there's a lot of logistics here, a lot of people involved, a lot of materials that are involved in the building of the temple, all right? But we learn a couple of things here, I think, about worship and how we can give our best to God. And the first one is this one, is that preparation is key to giving it all to God. 
Now, let's say today you've just decided that you're going to give it all to God. I want to give everything I am to God. Every, my life, my resources, everything I'm going to give to God. But, but God would never say to you, okay, well, I just want you to just do that willy-nilly and not put any thought into it. He would say to you that you need to be prepared. That, that you need to think this through, and that's what's happening here with Solomon. Solomon knew, Solomon knew how important it was for this project to be prepared and done correctly. And he also knew, he also knew that in his own heart that he had to be prepared in order to build something so grand and wonderful to God. He knew that they had to be, there had to be peace, and that's what he wanted. He wanted to have the right attitude when he went into this project. And you know, when we go into our own worship, when we go into giving our best to God, the, the, the best way that that's going to happen is if we go into it with preparation and we go into it with the right attitude. And, and that's the thing. Solomon knew he needed, to be in the, he needed to be in the right attitude before worshiping God. He needed to be in the, in the right place. You know, God can, God can deal... If, if we come into, our, uh, into worship with the right heart and the right attitude... God can deal with things in us. I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many times I've been over here and I've worshipped, and God is God brings something up from the week, or maybe there's an, there's something going on in my life, and He reminds me of something. Maybe I've there, there's a situation where I'm a little faithless, and He reminds me to be faithful and to trust Him. That's what worship can do, but we have to come in with the right attitude. We have to come in willing to hear what God has to say and what He's going to teach us. And, and my, my, I wonder how many of us, and, and I get it, if you have kids, if you're far away and you have to travel here to come to church, you know, even, even those of you that are online, I mean, sometimes things happen in life and it's really hard to be in the right place when you worship. <laughs> I, I get that. But I really want to encourage you to, to prepare better to worship. Um, something that, that I'm, I'm better at sometimes than others is making sure you have enough adequate sleep before you come Sunday morning. You know, making sure you're asleep and you're ready for what God has to tell you. Maybe you need to get up a smidge earlier Sunday morning to get ready. I, I don't know what it is, but, but what is it that God, what is it that you can do to prepare yourself better for worship? Just like, like Solomon here. He was preparing God's temple and he put a lot of thought into it. He didn't just say, all right, we'll just send some people up. No, he, he went into a treaty with somebody that could provide him the resources. He found the workers. He took care of his workers. And he had this plan in place for building this great and amazing temple. Solomon took it seriously. He took preparation seriously. You know, in, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, we, we've heard this before, but I, this is one of my life verses. It's one of the things that I try to remind myself a lot. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Whatever you do, whether it's in your work, whether it's in your family, whatever you do, you do it for the Lord. You know, Solomon understood that worship, the best worship, and I'm not saying that worship can't be done spontaneously, but the best worship is that which is planned. It's that that is, that is, that is thought through. You know, I will tell you this on our Sunday mornings. We, we do have, from time to time, we have snafus and things like that that happen. But let me tell you, there's a lot of thought and a lot of effort and a lot of planning that's put into our worship because we believe that God deserves that. God deserves thoughtfulness in how we approach worship. And so the same thing has to be true in your own personal worship. Maybe, maybe what you do is you have some kind of a reading plan that's organized. You know, don't, not just um, do what some people do. Well, I'll just open my Bible and, ah, here we go, and I'll read here today. I mean, that sounds all cool and it sounds like, oh, God might be leading me to that exact page. And, and I'm not standing here saying that you couldn't learn something there. But, but God is a God of order. And God desires for us to really be prepared, to really think through our worship. And so even in our daily walk, in our daily lives at work or, or school, how is it that we approach God each day with the way that we live our lives in worship? You know, one thing that I've, I do a lot um, for my own worship that's organized is on, there's an app called a Version, and on there there's tons of reading plans with questions, and you can keep prayer requests on there. That's the way that I can find that organization to my own personal walk. Um, and that's a way for me to take seriously my worship with God. I, there's a lot of different tools, let me tell you. You can go online, find all kinds of stuff, but 
there are things out there to help you be organized in how you walk in your faith. Take your faith seriously enough. If you want to give, your God, give God the best, put some thought into it. Just like Solomon here shows us in his own worship as he's building. All right. Here's what we're going to do next. This is what's a little bit different. So I thought about reading what it is that Solomon built. And I thought, okay, this is going to get kind of boring really quick because there's a lot of, a lot of details in what Solomon did when he built the temple. So I found this cool little five-minute video online. It's uh, the graphics. I'm going to tell you right now. The graphics are not, you know, Disney World, you know, graphics. Okay, The graphics aren't the most amazing graphics, but it gets across the point. I think of how amazing this temple was and how Solomon indeed did give his best. And in the background, we'll also hear someone reading the scriptures uh, there in 1 Kings 5 and uh, even over into uh, 1 Kings 7, okay? So um, you can just listen and follow along and we can watch it together how Solomon uh, built this, this great temple and worshiped to God. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, that he began to build the house of the Lord. And the house which King Solomon built for the Lord, the length thereof was threescore cubits, and the breadth thereof twenty cubits, and the height thereof thirty cubits. And the porch before the temple of the house, twenty cubits was the length thereof, according to the breadth of the house, and ten cubits was the breadth thereof before the house and for the house he made windows of narrow lights and against the wall of the house he built chambers round about five cubits high and they rested on the house with timber of cedar the nethermost chamber was five cubits broad and the middle was six cubits broad and the third was seven cubits broad for without in the wall of the house he made narrowed rests round about that the beams should not be fastened in the walls of the house the door for the middle chamber was in the right side of the house, and they went up with winding stairs into the middle chamber and out of the middle into the third. And the house, that is, the temple before it, was forty cubits long. And the oracle in the forepart was twenty cubits in length, and twenty cubits in breadth, and twenty cubits in the height thereof. And within the oracle he made two cherubims of olive tree, each ten cubits high. And he set the cherubims within the inner house, and they stretched forth the wings of the cherubims, so that the wing of the one touched the one wall, and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall, and their wings touched one another in the midst of the house. And he carved all the walls of the house round about with carved figures of cherubims and palm trees and open flowers, within and without. And the whole house he overlaid with gold, until he had finished all the house, and for the entering of the oracle, he made doors of olive tree. The lintel and side posts were a fifth part of the wall. So also made he for the door of the temple posts of olive tree, a fourth part of the wall. And the two doors were of fir tree. The two leaves of the one door were folding, and the two leaves of the other door were folding. And he carved thereon cherubims and palm trees and open flowers and covered them with gold fitted upon the carved work. And Solomon made all the vessels that pertained unto the house of the Lord, the altar of gold and the table of gold, whereupon the showbread was, and the candlesticks of pure gold, five on the right side and five on the left, before the oracle with the flowers and the lamps and the tongs of gold. And he set up the pillars in the porch of the temple, and he set up the right pillar and called the name thereof Jachin. And he set up the left pillar, and called the name thereof Boaz. And upon the top of the pillars was lily work. So was the work of the pillars finished. And he made a molten sea, ten cubits from the one brim to the other. It was round all about, and his height was five cubits. And a line of thirty cubits did compass it round about. It stood upon twelve oxen, three looking toward the north, and three looking toward the west, and three looking toward the south, and three looking toward the east. And the sea was set above upon them, and all their hinder parts were inward. And it was an hand breadth thick, and the brim thereof was wrought like the brim of a cup, 
with flowers of lilies. It contained 2,000 baths. And he made 10 bases of brass. Four cubits was the length of one base, and four cubits the breadth thereof, and three cubits the height of it. And on the borders that were between the ledges were lions, oxen, and cherubims. And every base had four brazen wheels. And the work of the wheels was like the work of a chariot wheel. Then made he ten lavers of brass. One laver contained forty baths, and upon every one of the ten bases, one laver. And he put five bases on the right side of the house, and five on the left side of the house. And he set the sea on the right side of the house eastward over against the south. So was ended all the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. So we have here a pretty extravagant structure, right? Um, it's really kind of hard to estimate what the cost is, and I, and I really don't want to do that. I've heard all kinds of numbers, hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe even into the billions. By, it depends on the amount of gold, obviously, that was put into it. But, but something that we learn here from Solomon that he teaches us in the construction of this temple is that worship is extravagant. You know, sometimes we go cheap with our worship. Sometimes we try to find shortcuts with our worship. You know, Solomon could have gone with some, some structure that was much more simple and not so ornate. But he wanted to give his best to God. He wanted to be extravagant. You know, no expense was spared here in the construction of the temple. From the quality of the wood, the stone cutters, those who worked with gold and the other furnishings, Solomon gave the best he had. Now, we don't have the resources that Solomon had, right? Um, no, I'm not telling you that in your backyard this week, you need to start building a temple made out of with gold and all these things, okay? But you know what? There are the things that you have been blessed with, those things that you have that you can bless God back with. Some, some of it is financial, the way that we give. Some of it's our time. Some of it's our talents. But we have all these abilities, all these things that have been given to God, given by God to us. And the question for us today, and the question that confronted Solomon is, are we giving our best of those things? Or are we giving what is left over? You know, the thing is, though, is when we give extravagantly, though, let's say maybe right now you are giving your best. Maybe you're giving a lot of time to God. You're, you, read, you read every day. You have a great relationship with God. Your givings, you know, you give to God. I mean, you, you do all these things well. We still have to even be careful then because in the midst of this whole story, and, and we've talked a lot about this in the previous uh, four or five chapters here, you, you almost get a sense here as we go through 1 Kings that Solomon, while he's doing a lot of good things, that there's some little pieces to the story where maybe he's kind of let his guard down a little bit. You know, if we go back in the early part, we read of how he had an alliance with the Egyptians, right? That was a dangerous thing. Now, you may say, hey, that led to peace, but as David, or as, excuse me, as Solomon continued to have more and more of these alliances, he got married to more and more foreigners, and what it ended up doing was it brought more and more false religion into Israel. And even here in the midst of these three chapters, in 1 Kings uh, 5 through 7, we run into a, another thing here that, that really jumps out at me, because if you go in 1 Kings 7, it says this. It says, it took Solomon 13 years. And, and I thought it was interesting. I, I looked at the text a little bit this week because I kind of wondered, okay, this word however, I mean, what, it, what does that mean? Because I almost get the sense here that, the, that, that it's saying <laughs> that Solomon, was, however Solomon took 13 years to build his temple, it didn't take that long, or to build his palace, it didn't take him that long to build the temple. So here in the midst of Solomon building this great and amazing, beautiful place, giving God the best, I've got this suspicion. And again, I've got to be really careful here because the text doesn't come right out and say it. And I want to be honest with you. But I almost get this sense that there's a little bit of a unease here. It took 13 years, Solomon 13 years, however, to complete the construction of his palace. And if we go on to verse 2, he built the palace of the forest of Lebanon, 100 cubits long, 50 wide and 30 high, with four rows of cedar columns supporting trim cedar beams. 
It was roofed with cedar above the beams that rested on the columns, 45 beams, 15 to a row. Its windows were placed high in sets of three facing each other. It's, all the doorways had rectangular frames. They were in the front part in sets of three facing each other. He made a colonnade 50 cubits long and 30 wide. In front of it was a portico, and in front of that were pillars and an overhanging roof. He built the throne hall, the hall of justice, where he was to judge, and he, he covered it with cedar from floor to ceiling. And the palace in which he was to live was set further back, was similar in design, and Solomon also made a palace like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had married. And all these structures from the outside to the great courtyard and from the foundation to the eaves were made of blocks of high-grade stone cut to size and smoothed on their inner and outer faces. And the foundations were laid with large stones of good quality, some measuring 10 cubits and some 8. And above were high-grade stones cut to size and cedar beams. And the great courtyard was surrounded by a wall of three courses of dressed stone and one course of dress or of trimmed cedar beams, as was the inner courtyard of the temple of the Lord with this portico. So we see here he builds this palace of great, that took great wealth and great resources. And again, I'm not downplaying at all his construction. He gave his best. But here in the midst of this extravagance, here's, here's something that I'm, I'm worried about with Solomon. And, and as we go a little deeper in the book, we might see this a little more. Here's the thing. Extravagance can be seductive. You know, Solomon, he had a perfectly fine palace that had been left to him by his father. But in the midst of this construction of the temple, he thought that it would make sense for him to build, build a new one. As a matter of fact, if you look at the actual dimensions, and again, you've got to be careful with comparing sizes here, but, but the palace was bigger than the temple. I, I, I've got this feeling that in the midst of this construction, he thought, wow, it would be really cool if I had a new place to hang out, you know, new place to sleep, new place to wow people. And that's a danger for all of us. Right now, in our country today, many people are doing well. You know, our economy, many have pointed out, is probably the best it's ever been. Perhaps, there's the, I've even heard some people argue that if you were to put up against on all of history, we are living in the greatest economy in all of the history of the world. Right now, financially. But be very careful it can be seductive and that's where Solomon I think kind of gives in here just a little bit you know in Matthew chapter 19 verse 24 we've heard Jesus say this but he said this again I tell you it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God he's not saying that rich people are bad people it's not he's not saying that actually some of the best Christian people I know are people that have some money but what he's saying is it's, it's harder. It's harder. Because that extravagance, those extra things that we have, can be so, so seductive. So seductive. You know, if you look out wider there in Matthew chapter 19, this was part of, of a parable that Jesus told. Let's go, let's go back to verse uh, number 16. It says, Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus replied, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. And the man re inquired, he said, which ones? You, and Jesus said, you should not murder, you should not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not give false testimony, honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. And the man, feeling pretty good about himself, said, hey, I've honored all these things. What do I still lack? And Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, Go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. You know what? Every single one of us in here today are richer than that rich man was in that story. I don't know if you've ever thought that before. You might have thought, oh, well, this doesn't apply to me because it's about a rich man, and I don't feel very rich. But when we look at the 
things that we have today, we are richer than this man ever was. And he walked away, and the same thing can happen to us. And I feel like Solomon, as I read through this text, Solomon, while doing amazing things for his nation, building this great and amazing extravagant act of worship, was still being seduced. Whether it was through relationships and treaties with foreign nations, with foreign gods, or whether it was through financial resources. See, what Jesus here is saying in Matthew chapter 19 is really, he's in, like he often does in many of his parables and in, in his teaching, he's trying to get the gospel boiled down, you know, for us to, to realize what it is. And, and really, if you think about it, the gospel is this. The gospel, <clears throat> we'll put it up here on the screen, the gospel is about the idea that less is more. The less of ourselves and what? The more of him. That's really what the gospel is about. I mean, when Jesus went on the cross, it was something done for us, not something we do for ourselves. Our salvation is not something we achieve for ourselves. It's something that has been paid for by someone else, by Jesus. The gospel is about the idea that less is more. And that brings us here to our, to our point today that I want to share with you. The God who gives the best deserves the best. Really, that is what this comes down to. And, and while there are some concerning things in the text, I don't want that to overshadow this amazing act of worship that Solomon gave to God because he knew that the, the God that he served gives the best and he deserved the best. Now, this was before Jesus came. I mean, we have even more reason today to realize that God has given us the best because we've seen Jesus come and die for us. You know, in Messy Spirituality, it was a book some, written some years ago, a guy by the name of Mike Iaconelli once said this. He said, I made hundreds of decisions to become a Christian. He said, or to rededicate my rededication, to, to go into full-time Christian service, to treat my parents better, to give God my hormones. I thought that was funny. I met every one of those decisions, yet I successfully acted on most of them for only about two or three days. I, I could tell you, every time I went to youth conferences when I was a kid, I mean, I was like, Jesus, I give it all to you, you know, and then four days later at school, yeah, maybe not quite everything, right? Well, he goes on to say, though, and I thought this was so cool. He said, still, those two or three days lead the groundwork for the next decision. I couldn't make the next decision if I had not made the previous one. I was growing one decision at a time. You know, today, if, as we're talking about giving our best to God, you may think, well, that means I've just got to do everything. You know, I, I've, I've just got to, let me tell you, I'm try, I also know we have to be realistic. Now, there are some people throughout history that have done that, who have just given up everything. But what I'm asking you today is to make one more decision in the right direction. One more, one more thing that gets you closer to giving everything to God. And, and maybe, maybe that would be teaching a children's class. Maybe that would be giving a little bit more. Maybe that would be spending more time in the community serving different organizations. I, but taking that little step that gets you there closer and building decisions on decisions after, and, and on more decisions. And that's my action for us this week. That's what I want us to consider doing this week is to remove a barrier that keeps you from giving your best. What is a barrier that, that does that? Maybe it's financially. Maybe it's, maybe it's your time. Maybe there are barriers that are there. Maybe financially you haven't made it a priority. Or maybe with your time, you've decided that other things come before how you serve God, whether it's in the church or in the community. What is it? What is the barrier that has gotten in the way of you giving fully to God and what he wants for you? I guess really when it comes down to it, it's, it's this question is, what will your story be? What will your story be? Will it be about giving everything to God or will you hold some things back? I want to close today with a story um, that, that really touched my heart. There was a man by the name of Craig. He had been an, uh, an alcoholic for more than a dozen years. He lost everything that he had. He lost his wife and his son um, due to his selfishness and his addiction. Things began to change after he gave his life to Christ, but he still would regularly fall back into old habits. It didn't help that he lost his well-paying job and he was working in a grocery store. 
and it didn't help that that grocery store was well stocked in many of the favorite alcoholic drinks that he enjoyed. And after a few years of going back and forth between Christ and the bottle, he finally cut the ties, and out of obedience to Christ, he quit his job so that he wouldn't be tempted anymore to fall into what to him in that, in that way was a, was a temptation to him. But he had no income, and he had only just this great hope in Christ, and he was in a desperate place. Well, after an interview he had with the sheet metal company down the street from the church that he was attending, he cried out to God. He said, God, he said, if you give me this job, I will give you my first paycheck. Well, God likes to test us, doesn't he, sometimes? And he got the job. And Craig, when you read his story, he clearly remembers the day when he got his first paycheck. He had tons of bills that needed to be paid. He was penniless, but he was determined in his faith. And he endorsed it, that check, and he took it over to his, to his church. And he walked in, and he put it in the offering plate on that Sunday morning. And he said that was the moment that changed his life forever, because he now understood what it meant to trust God. He gave God his best, all that he had. Now, the neat thing about Craig's life, though, according to the pastor of the church that he went to, was that Craig has been sober for over 25 years. For 25 years, he's been sober, and he is now an elder in their church. Such a cool story. But it was because he was a man that was willing to give it all, to give his best to God. And today, I want to challenge you to do that. Just like Solomon, he gave of his best you might not be building a temple that's adorned with gold and everything else, but you can give yourself. And really, that's what God wants the most, is you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the reminder today. Boy, I know I need it. I know all of us in this room, we need this, because we, we just get so busy um, with life, and, and our selfish nature just pops up again and again. Even if we've been a Jesus follower for... 50 years, um, our selfishness, our sinful nature just has a way of popping up. And, and God, help us to, to be aware of, of the seduction that comes by having much. The seduction that might come with having a lot of, with, with our time, the seduction that can come with our talents. God, we can be seduced into doing things and going in paths that that are just so destructive in the long term. And God, uh, we thank you for, for being a God who is extravagant to us. And God, help us to be more extravagant in our lives to you. God, you have blessed us with your son. The son who gave it all. He gave his blood, his beaten body on a cross to cover our sin. You have given us your best, Father. Now help us to give our lives to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name.